Professors and professionals, in this video, number three in the series, I'm going to talk to you about actions you can take to support students who have executive function challenges. In this video, I'm going to talk about things you can do in the classroom, things you can do in terms of the grades and your grading, and things you can do in terms of differentiation so that you can support these kids. There is a PDF guide. Go ahead and click that right now. You can open it up print it, you can stick it on your wall, put it in your executive function folder, whatever you want, but this will help you have some quick ideas of things that you can do to help support these students. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about the journey of helping a kid really overcome some of these challenges, and I'm going to get to the most specific assessment that I use with my students all the time that will sort of wrap things up for you in terms of this series. So first things first, let's talk about your classroom. As I always say, thank you so much teachers for what you do, for showing up, for being of service to these kids, to all kids, and for being helpful, for doing the most important job in the world. In your classroom or whatever you have that is similar to a classroom, okay, whatever environment you are using to work with kids, um, doesn't matter, these tips are very adaptable. So the first thing that I wanna say is auditory. I want you to really think about in your classroom what's going on in terms of the sounds. What distracting sounds for kids with sensory issues who might struggle with executive function are going on and what can be done about those. But I also want you to think about sounds in terms of can you implement white noise, brown noise, pink noise, gray noise into the classroom with kids like that, uh, Baroque music, what, what sorts of things might work in your classroom. And then the next thing that I want to talk about sounds um, is this, one of my favorite tools in the world, the timer. I use these all the time with my students because they are visual, you can see them, they are kinesthetic, you can touch them, and they are auditory, you can hear them. So um, I use these all the time. So anyhow, how can you make your class auditory? One way you can do it is Five minutes before class ends, you can uh, you can set the beeper so that it goes off five minutes before the class ends to tell you when class is ending, but really to tell these kids who are going to have to pivot to a new class that it's coming up. The next thing that I want to say with auditory after auditory is visual. You can see how in my office here, for example, this is my, I'm trying to point the right way, I'm pointing the wrong way. This is my pens and pencils box, my electronics box. I'm going to show you this stuff right now. But... I am all about visual in my classroom when I was a teacher and in my office now. I want everything to be so obnoxiously, largely visually labeled and color coded that these kids who struggle to execute, struggle to be prepared, struggle with all these things can really easily look around to find what they need. And when it comes to organization and getting things put back in the right place, it makes it very easy. This is a random box. If we're looking for something random in the classroom, I say look in the random box. If they want anything that has to do with mathematics, so whether it's a protractor, whether it's a ruler, whether it's a calculator, or anything else, it's going to be in a box obnoxiously labeled math. If they are looking for cables or chargers of any sort, these are all random electronic stuff. It is all in that box. I love these giant Sharpies, meanwhile, by the way. And if they're looking for pens and pencils, I have them in here. And it is even further done so that my kids who are doing the job for the night, they can get everything into the right place so super easily. Their folders, I have them obnoxiously labeled. It depends on the student, but I, I usually use that giant Sharpie. And I mean, these are kids who lose folders. And I, I, as a teacher, I would see so many kids who would leave a folder on the ground in the hallway. Next thing you know, it's kicked all over the place. 
Next thing you know, the janitors are walking through the hall, sweeping everything up at the end of the day, and it's gone. So sometimes I will put more details, like the teacher's name especially. I've had kids who in November, they still don't know their teacher's name. Um, if it's if they have an A to B day schedule, what time their class is, sometimes I put extra details on it. Either way, it is color-coded, it is simple. Even though these are super cheap folders and they fall apart, they're cheap and they're easy to replace. Um, and they're color-coded, so if LA is yellow, LA is yellow. I have them put their name on everything. This is even a charger. This is my charger. Why? I don't want to lose it. This is my timer, and my name is even on the timer. I mean, I put my name on everything because I've had, as a teacher, so many things walk out of my classroom, um, and here I don't want these kids losing things that are important to them. And finally, visual in terms of the calendar. Put these up on your wall. They're five bucks, teachers. Get a bunch of these. Put them in every corner of your classroom. Put all the important things so it's so visual and these kids can look at it. So next, visual, color, labels, label everything. Next, do tours of your classroom. So when your kid with executive function struggle says, hey, do you have a charger? You can be like, hey, let me take you on a tour of the classroom for two seconds and go walk around and re-show them the things. And when I do that, I say to them, you know, never in a condescending way, just in a positive way. All right, what's in this box? Electronics. What's in this box? Math. What's in this drawer? Where do you think the pencils are in my classroom? And I'm just want, because they're often not using their resources in their own mind that they already have. So do micro tours of your classroom with the kid. If you do jobs in your classroom, the kids who struggle with executive function, try to make that job as visual and easy for them as possible, but have them do those jobs, really reward them for them, walk them through it shamelessly and help them, you know, because them walking through their job, a job that's really clearly defined will help them. Next, very short directions posted around your room for procedures. So in my office where I'm at right now, um, I have a thing that says check in, and then it says take plan, and then it says execute. Three steps. First, they have to check in, write their name, what time it is. Then they have to take a daily plan, a little piece of paper where they write their daily plan for the night when they're working with me. And then execute means that they get started on whatever we're working on that night. But whatever processes you have in your classroom for turning in homework, for receiving homework, for getting homework online, um, and where the portal is and all that stuff, make it super concrete and put your processes up in gigantic fonts um, so that it is very easy for them to see. So that when they come to you and say, how do I do this? You say, oh, thank you for asking, but it's right there on the wall. Go check it out because you want them to gain that independence, but they need simple, concrete stuff that's not overwhelming, not a million details, just super simple stuff that is that helps support their executive function. Um, and finally, in terms of in your class, one of the things you can do is a one through five temperature check. As a teacher, I used to do this all the time. If you have 25 or 30 kids in the classroom and you, say, and you teach a little lesson, you can say, all right, everybody, who feels like they were um, very focused during this lesson. Five means you were super focused. One means you were not focused at all. Zero means like this is a really rough day for you. And they can show, you know, what number they would give their focus, concentration, attention, part of executive function, for example. Um, but you can look at the whole class. There's no shame in it, but you can make a mental note to yourself. Oh, that kid gave himself a one today. That kid gave himself a one and that kid gave himself a one. I better check in with those kids um, to, at some point today. Next, we talked about some things you can do in the class. Next, what can you do in terms of the grades? This one is very simple. These kids are often not aware of their grades. And when you ask them, and if they are, they're not realistic about it. And if you ask them what their grade is and they go to the portal to look for it, what they often do is they will look at the percentage and that's it. So they'll be like, oh, I have an 84.5, a B but they're not looking at the grade details. I have seen this consistently with middle and high schoolers over and over with so many of these kids who struggle with executive function. The brain just doesn't know to look for the details, and then when they see the mass chart, it's just too overwhelming. They don't know what to do with it. So helping the class multiple times throughout the semester break down how the grades work, what to look for, what patterns to look for, what's important, how things are weighted, 
um, you need to go over this multiple times, especially for these kids. Now, in terms of how your your portal works with the grades, please, teachers, I made a giant video about this, but I'm going to be brief here. Please make an FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions, very easy to find, page on your website or document that is online that's easy to access or something that's right in everybody's face that tells parents and the students everything. Look, I have so many kids who struggle so much with this stuff, with finding your information. Just make it easy for them, please. Where do you find your password? Where do you find your login? Or what is your login? What is your password? Where's the URL for this? Like every email you send out should have a link to the FAQ. And they should be able to get that. And it should say, when do you upgrade your, your grades? When do you update your grades? When do you update your homeworks? Where do you update your homeworks? What links do they have to click? People are spending so much time trying to find this stuff. And these kids are the last ones that are going to go sifting through this stuff. And their parents are often struggling to find it too. Please make this stuff easy for them. Make an FAQ answering all the common questions so they can find the information they need. And finally, with that, please add downloadable or printable PDFs of the assignments. These are the kids that ask you for their assignment four times over. They say, hey, I lost it. Can I have another copy? Can I have another copy? Can I have another copy? And I go through these kids' backpacks and find all these blank copies. Have a PDF, and you should never have to do that ever again, if they have a printer, of course, and it depends on, on that. That's uh, definitely a concern sometimes. But you should be able to say, hey, you know where it is. Oh, yeah, that's right. You have PDF on Google Calendar. In the, you know, Make it easy for everybody. Finally. Talked about the class, talked about grades, and I'm going to talk about differentiation. When you're dealing with kids who struggle with executive function, they often do not have a lot of buy-in. They often feel bored or uh, unengaged. What can we do about that? Teachers, rubrics are so powerful. Please learn to use rubrics. Please learn to use simple timelines rather than saying this thing is due in a month and the whole thing is due. These are the kids that wait till the last minute. So I'd rather you have a timeline where there are multiple last minutes within the month of when a project is due or a book is due or a report or something where there are multiple deadlines within it rather than the big thing at the end because these are the kids that wait till the night before. Have all of that stuff online and available to them so that they can easily see it. They can see your timelines. It's on Google Calendar or Calendar. Um, and in the rubrics, rubrics are so awesome. I can't go too into that in this video, but you can really do differentiation with a rubric with content process and product content is what you're teaching process is how the kids learn what you're teaching and product is how they show their learning. Typically products are, um, are papers and tests. But there are so many options for products that can give kids choice. The more choice they have, the more buy-in they have. The more buy-in they have, the more engagement they have. And that's what we want, is we want them to be engaged. So anytime you can use a rubric and you can give flexibility in terms of the content, the process by which they learn that content, and the product by which they show their learning, anytime you can give them choice in your rubric and in your time timelines or checklists or whatever, the better off they're going to be, the more they're going to get out of it. And the more these kids who struggle with execution can sort of access easier ways to execute on stuff because it matters to them. When they have more buy-in, the more it matters, the more they want to execute on the stuff, the less resistant they are. Again, there's a PDF that will help you through this. In the next video, I'm going to finally give you a what I use all the time in my practice of really nuts and bolts stuff that you as a teacher can do to help with this executive function stuff. And finally, please share my stuff right now. Click the teacher landing page. Send it to your teacher friends. Tell them, hey, sign up for this dude's thing. It's not too bad. My name is Seth Perler, and thank you teachers for what you do and for you how you show up on this planet to be of service to kids we need you be well